A scream rang out. As I traced the auditory source of evident horror, I was led to my daughter's room. I looked around quickly as I caught my breath from the reacting sprint, but nothing seemed out of place other than that tearing of a child under the bed. As I glimpsed at what might have caused any of this, I noticed her new doll, limbs contorted across the room. Going over to the bed to console her, Honey, what's wrong? Still sniffling, she managed to utter while shaking her finger towards the direction of the doll. It's gonna hurt me, she said. I bent over to the doll, causing her to turtle more under the bed and gave the doll a funny glimpse. It seemed to have a tidy setup, but the face gave an emotionless, disheveled appearance. I walked over to the bed and got on all fours to reach my daughter's face and held the doll next to me and gave it a shake. See, honey, nothing's wrong. It won't hurt you. She just wants to play, I said with a grin, pulling my daughter out and handing her back the doll in her shaking hands. Now be careful, honey, and as for your friend, you wouldn't hurt my precious girl, right? I said jokingly and gave the doll's hair a rub. Right, was the reply, but my daughter's lips never moved. I'm very worried about my son. More than worried at this point. Terrified. His behavior these past few weeks is not normal. Not healthy. It makes me think there's something wrong with him. At first, he would just come and stand at the doorway. He did this at night, just before I'd be ready to fall asleep. I'd roll over to turn off the lamp and he'd be standing there in the doorway. I used to try to speak to him. I don't do that anymore. He never has answered me. He just stares. A couple of days ago, he graduated from standing in the doorway to coming in and sitting on the bed. He still doesn't speak to me. I have asked him what he wants. I've asked him if there is anything bothering him. It's not like him to be so quiet, so silent. He usually waits until my wife is asleep. That's the part that gets me. She always falls asleep before me, and he has never come in when she's awake. But then, she didn't have a hand in this. If something doesn't change soon, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm starting to feel like he knows that I'm the one who killed him. She stalked the dark hallways of the school, making sure that she made no unnecessary sounds that would attract anyone. She had been following her math teacher for a few minutes now and was positive that she had seen him wander into the school building. She checked her watch. She had about an hour before the curfew. The school was deserted, as it had been for the last summer month. She was being extra cautious, she didn't want anyone to see her following her teacher into the school. That could only bring trouble. She followed her teacher into the dark hallways. Her teacher seemed to be wandering aimlessly, oblivious to his follower. She waited for him to move into someplace quieter so she could make her move. Finally, her teacher stopped in front of the bathroom, probably intrigued by the sound of rumbling pipes and slowly made his way inside. Perfect, she muttered to herself as she reached around for her pink backpack and withdrew a bloodied, solid lead pipe from within and made her way into the bathroom. She carefully closed the bathroom door behind her and ever so softly turned the lock. The soft clink of the lock made her teacher turn around to face her. She could see the look of confusion in the old man's eyes. She followed his gaze to the lead pipe in her hands and watched as his face contorted into a hideous snarl as he lunged towards her. A smile forming on her lips, she sidestepped and drove the pipe with all her might into the back of his head with a sickening thump. She watched him crash into the floor. Soon enough, a pool of dark blood formed around his head. She had done this way too often than she cared to admit. 
As her math teacher lay on the white tiled bathroom floor, twitching uncontrollably from the skull bashing he had received just a few seconds earlier, she stood over him, her feet on either side of his waist. She looked him right in the eye and said, This is for the C- minus on my last paper, and drove the pipe into his skull again, finishing him. As she wiped blood and brains from the lead pipe, the walkie-talkie in her backpack crackled. Bulldog, this is Base. What's your status, over? Base, this is Bulldog, she said. The school is clear. I repeat, the school is clear. Returning to the base now, over and out, she said. As she made her way out of the bathroom, she glanced towards the corpse of her math teacher and muttered to herself, Man... This has been stressful. I'm glad this is over with. I'd like to tell you a disturbing story I heard from people I know or have met. I was living in the southern part of Sydney four years ago in a big house. One day I advertised to share the house so I could save some money. The next day, a young Indian-looking guy around 30 came to the house. However, he wanted to leave quickly after I showed him the spare room. I wanted to know what he thought about sharing the house with me. He said he liked the house but didn't want to move in because of the cat. On the way out, I simply asked him if he knew what was really going on in the world. There wasn't really much of a reason for it, I just wanted to chat a little. He replied, are you talking about conspiracies? When I said yes, he looked up at the four corners of the room and asked if there was a bug of any kind. I told him I didn't think so. Afterward, he started to whisper with a very serious face. I know everything about conspiracies, he said. I can even write my own book or create my own website just for all the information that I know. When my mother was alive, she used to work in a hospital. She was constantly telling me, there is a secret room in the hospital where very rich people go to drink our blood. At the time, I already knew about the Illuminati's blood drinking natures, since I read The Biggest Secret by David Icke, but I was very surprised about the secret room in the hospital. Six months passed and I met a guy at a political meeting that I became good friends with. One day, when I told him the story about the Indian guy, he wasn't very surprised about the secret room in the hospital. Instead, he gave me more information about the Red Cross. He replied, I can believe that. There's something fishy going on about the Red Cross. Many of the rooms at the Red Cross Center in Sydney have a special lock system employed on them. You have to have a special security clearance to enter each room. According to the man who works at the Red Cross, two men used to work there. However, when they went to Thailand, they were killed somehow. My friend thinks both of them found the true nature of the Red Cross. In the fall of 2021, a man hung himself in a bottling factory of a popular over-the-counter sleep aid company just outside of Chicago. The man worked as a quality control manager and had just been laid off to save the company money. In the morning, the cleaning crew found him swaying in the breeze from the air conditioning system with a note in his breast pocket that read, Sleep Tight. Over the next few months, a string of strange deaths were associated with areas where the sleep aids from the factory were shipped. Seemingly, healthy people had died in their sleep from apparent strangulation. All the victims had severe bruising on their throats. Oddly, police were unable to ascertain how the murderer entered the victim's home or possible motive for the murders. Further vivid reports began coming in from people who had taken the pills but not died. One lady reported taking the pill and right before she fell asleep, she opened her eyes and a bald, middle-aged man wearing a short-sleeved shirt, white-collared, was hovering just above her face. She closed her eyes, hoping the man would disappear, but when she opened her eyes, he was there. 
inches from her face. She even recalls feeling the man's breathing on her forehead. He then began strangling her. Luckily for her, her husband noticed her grasping for air in her sleep and quickly woke her. Another man recalls falling asleep after taking the pills. He awoke to the figure of a man swaying in the corner of his room. He turned on the light next to his bed and saw the man with better accuracy. He was a bald, middle-aged man, wearing a short-sleeved, white-collared shirt. The bald man then removed the noose from his neck and reportedly floated towards the man attempting to strangle him. Again, it was the man's spouse who woke him. He awoke gasping for air in sheer terror. The FDA did a full investigation and found no evidence of tampering. Even after a recall of the pills in a public awareness campaign warning of possible tampering, the deaths and reports of the bald man didn't stop. It was only when the company shut down the factory that the deaths and reports decreased. It is unknown how many deaths were the result of the apparent tampering or how many of the pills from that factory are still sitting in cabinets across the country today.